What are we fighting for? This community, our advocacy, the blood, sweats, and tears that we pour into our work, the causes we've dedicated ourselves to fighting for, what purpose does it serve? As socialists, what is it we hope to gain and how do we plan to go about affecting change? What is the overarching goal, the mission statement, the oath we swear upon when we step into the ring of the power struggle between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, a battle that has been raging on for centuries. We're not just faces on a screen. What we do now when we broadcast our voices to hundreds of thousands of listening ears, when we call out those who continue to oppress and keep us down by any means necessary, when we work to demystify leftist ideals and envision a future that would at last collapse all power structures and place in our hands the key that was stolen from us by those who sought to keep us for ransom, when we pull the gloves off and fight like hell for one another, for the marginalized, for the weak, vulnerable, and voiceless. When we echo the words of philosophers past and establish ourselves as the vanguard of the modern workers' revolution, we are following in the footsteps of every single soul who fought and died so we could be where we are now in every single decision we make. Every bridge we either choose to burn or build, every line that we choose to draw, and how we choose to address whatever or whomever we believe is in obstacle. All of these things will reverberate into the future and affect our trajectory, much like the actions taken by revolutionaries in the 1900s and before who died for this cause reverberated out to where we are now. Everything counts. We are not speaking into a vacuum. We can either recognize that we are in the midst of what will become a defining moment for our movements and unified like never before, or fall into the same old pattern of compromises, concessions, and endlessly shooting ourselves in the foot when we should know better. We either make it or we break it. And it's time to stop acting like there's a debate to be had. We must define what it means to be a socialist in the year 2020. To elucidate on what I want to get across in this video, right now, factions within the leftist community in BreadTube are mono a mono in perhaps the most intense debate we've ever found ourselves in, whether to vote blue no matter who or to commit to saying never Biden. Both sides are fiercely committed to their side of the debate, but the rising tension, bitterness, backstabbing and bickering that's beginning to rear its ugly head like never before has revealed the frayed seams within an already splintered community and exposed fatal flaws that must be dealt with immediately if we're to have any hope of pushing through this era of history. The issue that we're dealing with is a fundamental disconnect between those who believe it's necessary and morally correct to vote and work within the system that we have, i.e reformism, and those who place more value in organizing, strikes, unions, and working outside the system. To understand the magnitude of the decision we're being faced with, as well as the danger of conceding to any higher power directly opposed to workers' movements, we need to do a few things first. Look into the history and observe the times in which socialist activists and philosophers spoke about this very conflict, as well as why any compromise with the bourgeois would only serve to harm and slow our movements. Secondly, we need to look at the history of elections in this country and specifically focus on the ones from 2008, 2012, and 2016 to reveal the growing disillusionment with the DNC and the electoral process as a whole, as well as the many times that the media and Democratic Party have tried to use the narrative of a fascist takeover to fearmonger and threaten anyone who dares to break ranks with them. Lastly, we should focus on burgeoning grassroots movements such as the DSA and Genstrike 2020, as well as online communities like ours, BreadTube, and discuss why a. Fighting for workers and actively addressing any and all attempts to surrender our power should be, as a friend put it, our bread and butter. And B. Reveal the split now occurring where certain voices are drifting back to the center while others rocket to the fringes of the left, and why this split is a direct consequence of being unwilling to do what must be done. And it only seems right to kick things off with a quote from the founder of our movements, Karl Marx. During a 
speech for the Central Committee to the Communist League, he said, Even when there is no prospect of achieving their election, the workers must put up their own candidates to preserve their independence, to gauge their own strength, and to bring their revolutionary position and party standpoint to public attention. They must not be led astray by the empty phrases of the Democrats, who will maintain that the workers' candidates will split the Democratic Party and offer the forces of reaction the chance of victory. All such talk means that the proletariat is to be swindled. And as we speak, YouTubers like Vosh and Xander Hall and esteemed figures like Noah Chomsky are claiming that if we don't vote for Biden, we're opening the door to a fascist and authoritarian takeover of America and doing untold amounts of harm to marginalized people in the process, even though the working class and millennial and Gen Z generations are aware the vast majority of marginalized peoples exist, but... <laughs> Go on. This idea that we must continue to submit to parties that were built to oppose us because of some unforeseen danger that comes from propaganda being perpetrated by the mainstream media and the DNC, who, as Marx prophesied, are telling us that pushing too far left will split the party, weaken it, and allow fascism to fully take hold in America. We're told over and over again that now is not the time for radical policies, as in literally anything that would give workers an ounce of leverage. And both parties use dog whistles to cloak their agenda in seemingly innocuous language. When they say your policies and movements harm the country, they mean your policies and movements harm us. This is how the bourgeois keeps its boot on your neck. All they have is fear. And unfortunately, these campaigns of fear have been fairly effective at convincing white middle-class liberals who form the core of the Democratic Party's base to turn their nose up at people like ourselves because we're just being too aggressive. They're blinded to their own oppression, pacified, and told to settle. That any and all solutions can only come from above, and anything else is not to be trusted or taken seriously. Sounds kind of like religion, doesn't it? Even though liberals are looking to leftists for answers. Despite this, the aforementioned YouTubers are socialists who are implying that at this point in history, it'd be more beneficial for us to vote for one of two pro-capitalist, anti-socialist parties, drop all of the progress we've made up to this point, and sell ourselves out because fascism and, well, maybe Biden won't be as bad. Which sounds Sounds like something a liberal would say. Interesting. Let's examine this whole fascism thing, shall we? It centers on the idea that Trump is this horribly dangerous figure who poses a threat to our democracy unlike anything we've ever seen, and that a Trump victory in November would mean the ends of America as we know it. Is he really that much worse than any of the presidents who came before? Y'all might not like hearing this, but uh... No. It's fascinating to me how socialists have been aligning with liberals and calling Trump a fascist and a Nazi and completely ignoring the atrocities that were committed by Theodore Roosevelt, like when he said the only good Indians are dead Indians, removes them from the little land they had left, furthered imperialism and the brutality of torture. Nixon, whose entire administration was full of criminals, failed to cover up his attempted break-in of the DNC, worsened the already horrific Vietnam War. Reagan, who allowed a literal genocide of the LGBTQ community to occur while letting evangelism take root in our government, oversaw the Iran-Contra scandal, removed officials from the EPA and other government agencies, destabilized the country through Reaganomics. I could literally make an entire video just on Reagan. Seriously. George W. Bush, who killed hundreds of thousands in the Middle East after lying about the presence of nuclear weapons, created a massive torture program in which children and mothers were raped and tortured many more in Abu Ghraib, built Guantanamo Bay, abandoned black Americans during Katrina. And this is barely scratching the surface of the war crimes and evil acts committed by leader after leader after leader. In what way is Trump worse than any of them? In what way is he leading a fascist takeover that we're now on the cusp of or have been for four years now? The DNC keeps yelling like evangelicals screaming about the rapture that it's still coming! We're in the end times! The signs couldn't be clearer! We can't re-elect him! And I'm over here like, wow! Worst fascists 
ever. You'd rather stake your life on a what if than actual evidence. Now, this isn't to downplay the threat posed by groups like the alt-right, because we must be vigilant in opposing any and all forms of nationalism and or fascism where they arise. But as of yet, they've been too fractured to build strong momentum and are almost always chased out by crowds of anti-fascist protesters that are nearly five times the size or larger. And we certainly haven't seen anything like the lynchings of black people and burning down of black neighborhoods and businesses like we saw from the early 1900s to the civil rights era. Even though we are still in a crisis state with black Americans being routinely killed for no reason, like the shooting at a black church, the killing of Freddie Gray, and so many more, this is more a reflection of America the ideology, something that has been part of the country's roots since its inception. This happened with Obama and so many other presidents throughout history. Rises in hate crimes have correlated with the elections of more overtly racist and xenophobic presidents, and the current rise we're seeing now is the continuation of a pattern that has continued on since our founding. This is not unique to Trump, and he himself is not uniquely bad. Where are the roving squadrons of militant fascists who have become the new face of the American police states? If there are members of the alt-right or people associated with it in government, what power do they actually have in enacting any sort of racist and or genocidal policies with the checks and balances currently in place, weakened as they may be? Active members of the alt-right like Nick Fuentes actively shield their involvement because they see it as bad optics, and Steve Bannon was fired when comments of his that were white supremacist in nature surfaced. They are nowhere near being organized enough or even having the numbers to pose a significant threat to national safety. And how often has the Democratic Party yelled about fascism as a way to divert attention from their botched campaigns and ignore the responsibility that they share for why we are where we are? They support bailouts, the widening of the wage gap, broken healthcare policies, loosening of corporate regulations, anti-socialist and union-busting laws, imperialist wars and illegal interventions, etc., etc., and ignore the crisis of police brutality and the intensification of class warfare just as much as Republicans do. They're two sides of the same bloody coin, and as another friend put it, form the two heads of the great capitalist snake. Hot take, liberals are more comfortable allying with fascists because they're both opposed to socialists. What? And before anyone tries to use the COVID crisis as a wedge to debunk what I'm saying, wow, a corrupt private healthcare industry completely mismanaged a health crisis. Who could have seen this coming? Need we bring up how the public's mood towards electoralism and the two-party system has been changing more and more dramatically since the 2008 election. When Obama was elected in 2008, many thought this heralded the arrival of a new era for the country, an era in which the struggle for civil rights would culminate in the first black president and a turning point for the country. Remember hope and change? The only turning point was the neoliberal establishment going further down the drain. Obama sided with and bailed out Wall Street, sending not a single executive with criminal charges to jail. He increased drone strikes in the Middle East that destroyed schools, hospitals, innocent people's homes, and killed untold amounts of civilians in the process. He defended police officers, the genocide of Palestinians in Gaza, jailed protesters and whistleblowers, did nothing to stem child poverty or rampant gerrymandering of African American neighborhoods, did nothing to stop Bloomberg's stop and frisk program, not to mention his cabinet was full of Clinton advisors as well as members of Bush's administration. It was more of the same, just with different packaging. And this caused a rupture within the Democratic Party in which black voters sat out the 2012 and 2016 elections while others changed parties to vote for Trump. He accelerated the delegitimization of the Democrats, which directly led to the rise of the Tea Party, which in turn fueled the rise and election of Trump. And he didn't even need a fascist movement to win. He was a political outsider and took advantage of people's growing frustration with business as usual politics. And the DNC certainly didn't do themselves any favors by propping up Hillary Clinton, someone who is out of touch to an astronomical degree with most Americans because of the wealth, privilege, and government she'd been insulated in for decades. They learned nothing from 2008 and 2012, and her loss in 2016 led to a massive loss of political power for the Democrats across the country. They were divided amongst each other, but united in their opposition to us. Now, need we mention Hillary helped kickstart the Russiagate conspiracy, and that if Trump
Trump were impeached, we'd now have Mike Pence as president, someone who's a radical evangelical and dangerous on a level that Trump never will be? Imagine how those disillusioned voters are feeling now when the DNC hands us with their cold, dying corpse, Joe freaking Biden, the equivalent of a seaside from an album that no one wants to hear, and a pale imitation of something more and more voters already want nothing to do with. And Biden couldn't even be considered an Obama 2.0. Throughout his career, he supported the nomination of Republican senators, actively supported racist segregationist policies, would more than likely pick a conservative Supreme Court judge wouldn't legalize weed and is now caught in a serious sexual abuse scandal, much like Bill Clinton and Trump. It's almost like there's a pattern there. He did nothing to stop Obama's more authoritarian policies, and there's no evidence whatsoever to show he'll have a sudden change of heart now. We can't convert him at this point. He'd even cut Social Security and health care, just like the GOP want to, and openly said so on numerous occasions. How is he even considered a liberal? If he says he wants to fight for progressive causes like a living wage and health care, it is all but certain that he's paying lip service. He's not bipartisan, he's a chump. And it's clear that six months before the election, he's no longer mentally fit for office. Imagine how brutal the debates between him and Trump are going to be. He'll be made into a joke and seen for the con that he is. If the Democrats lose, it is their fault. Let them fall on their own sword and don't let yourself be associated with their downfall. There is no lesser evil. Trump and Biden may be different shades of evil, but it's foolish to try to remove all nuance and say that one is less bad than another, as if that excuses anything. We've seen how the public moves like a pendulum between Democratic and Republican presidents. Who's to say a Biden victory wouldn't open the door for a truly horrific GOP candidate, someone even worse than Bush or Pence? At some point, we're going to have to ask ourselves, what are we doing? The electoral system is completely broken. Because we're forced to vote for one of two candidates and get nothing out of it, regardless of who we pick, and because of how relentlessly socialists like us are told that electoralism has always been about picking the lesser of two evils, more and more people are outright abandoning the system and choosing instead to engage in activism in their communities, to use their voices however they can, and to further the fight for workers' rights in any way that doesn't involve being pulled into the black hole that is the two-party system. And what really gets under my skin is how some YouTubers on the left have gone out of their way to attack people like myself who refuse to vote, even though so many of us have completely justifiable reasons for doing so. You can disagree with us, but don't disregard us. Saying that we're being too emotional or outright calling us brain dead like Xander Hall did before blocking me while refusing to engage with all of the resistance they're encountering and trying to understand why we think the way we do is only going to push people away from engaging in any sort of fruitful activism. Instead of acknowledging the fact that the election is not the be-all end-all, we're sitting here arguing about semantics and pointless drama, talking instead of listening and bragging about our wealth of knowledge whilst simultaneously being blissfully unaware of how foolish we're making ourselves and our community look to those on the outside. The ones who are, you know, being affected by the same external forces that are affecting us? Vladimir Lenin said in an essay that, the sooner the masses realize what their own interests are, the sooner they will understand the hostility of the liberals to the mass movements, the sooner they will alienate themselves politically from the liberals and enter various democratic, revolutionary organizations, unions, parties, etc. There is a direct line from A to B, from the workers being oppressed to liberating themselves, and in the way stands the two-party system. Frederick Ingalls said in the labor movements in America, America regarding the aftermath of the Haymarket Affair, the next step is to find the common remedy for these common grievances and to embody it in the platform of the new Labour Party. And this, the most important and the most difficult step in the movement, has yet 
to be taken in America. It's 2020. That last line still rings just as true. We're being told to vote blue no matter who, as if it's a virtuous thing to do, when it's nothing more than a manipulative tactic meant to keep us in line. And staying in line means forever being dependent on the capitalist class. Leftists have no leverage against the DNC, mainstream media, and government at large, because we continue to feed a beast that was built to consume us. Giving any power to our oppressors is a betrayal to our movement. Regardless of why it's being done, if you're a socialist and place the interest of the capitalist class over yours, regardless of how much you harp on about philosophy and morals, you have turned your back on us. Democrats who endlessly bleed on about the necessity of giving concessions to whichever barely centrist candidate they shove down our throats are only worsening class struggle and proving us rights. There's an international workers' movement now building across the world, but because we now at last have momentum with organizations like the DSA and Gen Strike 2020, we're suddenly expected to make sacrifices to the very people we're opposed to? Excuse me? They won't compromise with us, so why the f fuck should we compromise with them? In fact, why are we working ourselves to death trying to appeal to the white middle class? They'd rather live in capitalism and don't truly want equality, no matter how many equal rights signs they put in their front yard. Leave it behind. Even though events throughout history like the revolutions that swept across Europe in 1848, the Pullman Strike, the Paris Commune, the Battle of Seattle in 1999, all of the major workers' uprisings in the 20s and 30s, and Occupy Wall Street were ultimately crushed, we were able to learn from them and adapt little by little so we could get to where we are now. And the time has never been better than right now to form a new vision for the future of leftism, of bread tube, of of this community, this movement, and everyone in it. In my opinion, what I think would benefit us most is if we a. Use the disillusionment and frustration that's been steadily growing over the past few decades and reaching a boiling point during the spectacular failure that was the 2016 election to fuel people's anger towards the capitalist class. B. Hammer on the Democratic Party as hard as we possibly can due to its becoming so fractured and volatile and create the wedge that will lead to a split. C. Consider the effect on the socialist movement for every decision we make and do all that we can to strengthen it. D. Not see our struggle as merely the wealthy versus the 99% lest we fall into class reductionism, but instead give all the aid we can to indigenous peoples, people of color, immigrants, the LGBTQ community, and examine why we must be opposed to anything that would seek to subjugate those who are marginalized and powerless. E. Immediately address voices that say we should vote blue no matter who, when we know exactly where that rhetoric will lead and reform frame our mission as the workers against the bourgeois instead of Democrats versus Republicans. And F. Refuse to work within the confines of the two parties because we recognize the inevitable results of doing so. This is what happens to AOC, Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, the people who are supposed to be the new stars of the left. None of them have voiced support for things like Gin Strike 2020, even though Omar did voice her support for a rent strike. When it comes to anything that that would resemble something truly leftists. They've remained mum. Hashtag not my squad. Even Bernie could barely be considered a centrist. He didn't stand up for workers' rights when the COVID crisis began. He refused to criticize the party. Called Biden a good friend. Didn't push hard enough against the corporate bailouts in the stimulus bill. And organized workers around a class instead of showing the issues with class. He was the compromise, not the golden boy. And it doesn't matter what your background or reputation were beforehand. The moment you enter the Democratic Party is the moment you bend the knee and shed whatever leftist ideals you had going in. There's only so far you can move from the two parties and eventually the rope around your neck will tighten and force you to return to the center. There's a massive difference between socialism and social democracy. There are too many people on the left looking at the aforementioned figures as saviors of the movement when all we're doing is holding ourselves back by doing so. Socialism is the only path 
forwards. The next four years are going to be difficult regardless of who wins the election in November, but we can't allow our momentum to be halted. Look at how people like Jimmy Dore and Kyle Kalinske have broken ranks with other voices on the left. They are actively calling for a workers' party and going after Bernie for his failure to truly fight for us when we needed him the most. The tides are changing and there's a growing awareness of the need to fight and to fight hard and to stop selling our souls to the devils of capitalism. We have to do more than just work outside the system. Our strikes, moves to unionize, and bolster organizations like the DSA, as well as new ones that are bolder in their vision for our future and continue to push us further leftward. All of it's must have a greater goal. We can't just fight for a living wage, for paid sick leave and other policies, and leave it there. America was founded on patriarchal bourgeois ideals. The seeds were planted from the very beginning that led to wage labor and inequality, and to a powerful capitalist class that wields seemingly unchallengeable power over the workers. If we settle even remotely and refuse to be bold like we need to be at this point, our cause will be killed on the spot, period. This is a difficult conversation, but one that we need to have. There's an inevitable end to repeating the same mistakes of the past over and over again and never truly learning your lesson. We should know better than this. Going backwards means losing years of progress, if not an entire generation. And I'm not willing to make that sacrifice. Put your foot down. Sever the cord that ties you to your oppressors. Take off the rose-colored glasses that they put on you and hoist up the red flag. The future is bright, and I know we're only going to grow stronger as time goes on. Eyes forward, arms interlocked, minds ablaze with visions of the years to come. Solidarity with every comrade. We are in this together.